Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody out this morning. Missing quite a few folks this morning. That's just okay. It happens sometimes for whatever reasons. I'll just introduce by doing some reading this morning. Uh, I'm going to go to John, first chapter. Just read the first few verses there and go to uh, Hebrews. You join me in a word of prayer while, while we start. Most precious Heavenly Father above, we come to you this morning to give thanks for this opportunity to gather. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of coming out to worship. And we just have a desire to just praise your name and lift up the name of Jesus as we speak. In all things, Father, we just give you, give you the glory because you are the maker of all, all things. We just thank you for your mercy to us and your love shown toward us. We thank you that you watch over us when we're sick. We thank you that you watch over us when we're, we're well in, in many ways. Sometimes we can be sick in spirit, sometimes we speak of sick in the flesh, but you're again, you're the great physician and you do watch over us and you care for us. We just ask you to go with us this morning, this time uh, that we can share some thoughts and, and be with Jerry as he comes before us to preach. Thankful to have Sister Bev with, Beverly with us and just good to see her and each one. Sister Nancy's been out for a little while, but just thank you. Thankful again for, for those blessings that you grant. Forgive us of our shortcomings, O oh Father, and just continue to direct our paths and make us submissive unto your will in our life that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we give thanks and amen. amen. Okay, first chapter of John. Just want to read the first few verses here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's kind of a picture that was hard to, hard to imagine. It's, it's hard to really picture that. But I think, I think that's just what it's saying. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is Jesus Christ, the Word was with God, Jesus was with God in the beginning, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That's a powerful verse. If we don't read anything else, Amen. that just explains. This explains very simply. In the beginning, whenever that was, it doesn't make any difference. People argue all over the place. Oh, it's only 6,000 years ago. Oh, it's only 4,000. Oh, it's only half a million or, or 200 million. We don't know when it was. The important part is to know without any doubt, in the beginning, God. That's the way it begins in Genesis, isn't it? In the beginning, God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything, not anything made that was made. That's another very big verse. I can't comprehend it, Hollywood Jerry. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Who's this talking about? It's talking about Jesus Christ right here. And the light shineth in darkness. In the beginning, everything was void. There was no light. It was all darkness. And the light shineth in darkness. Jesus. And the darkness comprehended it not. We can just about use that to the, to the, those who do not see Jesus in any way. They cannot see the light. They do not experience the light. All they are, they're walking in darkness, brethren, and they don't see that. And yet I can't make them see it. It's, it's, if I could preach... For two days in a row, I couldn't, I couldn't preach enough 
to make somebody see it. This is a gift from God, brother. It's a, it's a precious gift from God and God alone. I mean, it's not man's choice in this thing. In him was life, the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This John the Baptist. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through, or that all men through him might believe. Through him. He was not that light. This John the Baptist was not the light. He was a forerunner of the light. He came to tell those of one who was coming. Who actually was here at that point. He was not that light. But was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. That has not changed one iota since the beginning. In the beginning was the word that has not changed. He came unto his own, his own people. And his own received him not. They denied him. But as many, here's another one that I just love. Yeah. But as many as received him as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Brother, we are sons of God today because God gave us the power to become the sons of God. Amen. Even to them that believe on his name, even to them, which simply, you can take that even out, gave he power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. That even was added in there. It's in italics here. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred or greater. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. We've talked about that many, many times, and grace for grace. When you think about that, it's only by his grace that we have a relationship with him. It's by His grace. And it's by His grace that we're able to receive that relationship we have with Jesus Christ in His life. It's not of our own doing, brother. It is of Jesus Christ, of the Word. And of His fullness have all we received and grace for grace. And that grace for grace is just over and over and over again, is it not? Yes, it is. For the law was given by Moses... But grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. He hath declared God to us, the Son, the Word. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. This is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou the, that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? And John responds, 
He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. This is another one I love. I baptize with water, John says. But there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth, Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. He should be made known to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, of whom Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, I could go on there, but I don't want to right now. I want to go to Hebrews just a minute. Go to the book of Hebrews. And I'll stop with just a short reading here. But then, you know, that, that's such a powerful mm-hmm. chapter, just so powerful. And, and just, it, it's all of Jesus Christ. Now, this, this in chapter 1 of Hebrews, as, as most of know that, that's here this morning, this is talking about the superiority of, of the high priest, the most high priest, that's the, the high priest of Jesus Christ. And, and the the superiority of him over the other priests that come and serve the tabernacle. Chapter 1 in the book of Hebrews says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us, and that comes all the way down to us, brother, it does, hath in these last days spoken with, unto us by His Son, whom He, God, hath appointed an heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, who, being the brightness of His glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Now think of that. When he, Jesus, that's what this is talking about here. When Jesus had had already purged our sins, we do not have to fear the purging of our sins. They've been purged. Once something purged, it's done. It's taken away. No more. Exist no more. When he had by himself, nobody else, none of the none of the high priests before in the tabernacle could purge the sins of the people. None. Well, why did they do what they done? Well, that's what the Lord sent them to do. That was a and he, I'll use this word. That was an example of that which was to come in in Jesus Christ in the superiority he had over all the prophets. Being 
Yeah, sit down on the right hand of majesty on high. Yeah, I, I want to read again. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have, have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall, not maybe, he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. We don't worship angels, and I believe angels are real. Even today, I believe angels are real. And beyond that, I don't understand much about it, Brother Jerry. Angels are spoken of an awful lot. We've been studying that in, in Bible study. Angels. It's, they're all over the Bible. We we're not to worship them. We we're not to put them higher than the most Superior angel of all. He's not the angel, but he's he's superior to every other prophet, every other being, if you will. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, God says, and let all the angels of God worship him, Jesus. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God... Even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old, as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But the which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. And this can happen so easily. We all know that. That can happen so quickly and so easily. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, certain, and every transgression a disob and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Ninth verse. But we see Jesus, who, being, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Oh, we can go on. I don't want, I don't need to. Brother Jerry, come preach to me. that it might be kind of anticlimactic from here on out <laughs> no. 
And that's okay. That's, man. I'm sitting there thinking, he took the words right out of my mouth. I want to go to Hebrews as well. Good. But I want to go to the 13th chapter of Hebrews. All right. Because this is the exact same subject. And so, and I'm not kidding, this is the exact same subject That's right. as the first chapter of John, yeah. the first verse, first several verses that you read. And like I said, he took the words right out of my mouth. And I hope the Lord blessed me with some liberty here as he did Brother Gary. And if he doesn't, take this home with you and maybe the Lord will give you some liberty to study it. Uh, the 13th chapter of Hebrews in the 8th verse. He says, the writer here says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And I heard people say, well, yesterday, what's he mean by yesterday? Well, I think yesterday means every day yesterday. I think that means before. I think yesterday means every day before now and even before the foundation of the world. I think yesterday covers all that, Brother Gary. Amen. I think yesterday was when God the Father chose us when the Godhead chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. When he, when they, how do you talk about God when he or when they? It's three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And all these three being equal in power, but yet they're one, but yet they're three. I heard Brother Don explain that one time as being like, kind of like he used the example of water. You have steam and you have water and you have ice. They're all water. They're all the exact same. They're just three different ways that water can be in these different forms. And so you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I believe that Jesus Christ was there when this plan was drawn up, without lack of better words, Absolutely. drawn up. Absolutely. And so I think he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And I just love that. In the beginning, yeah. in whose beginning? It wasn't God's beginning. God doesn't have a beginning. And man likes to think, well, everything has a beginning. There's a dead fly on that microphone. Brush your teeth. Dead flies in the apothecary. In the ointment of the apothecary, send forth a stinking savor. <laughs> okay. You know what that means, don't you? Yeah, I think so. That's when there's dead flies in the an apothecary is a pharmacy. And so they made up this medicine in a pharmacy back years ago in these bowls, probably with these handles and that they crunched this stuff up and they, it wasn't near like what today and they didn't have the controlled environments and they probably had flies around and a lot of flies and so you had flies that would get in that stuff and it would it would die in there and probably start to smell if it and you know it would send forth this stinking smell and you know what today that is I think I think that's the gospel today when men put this they allow flies, they allow things to get into the true word of God Amen. that really doesn't belong in there. They allow that to get in there. And you know what? It, it stinks. It doesn't really portray what Jesus truly did. Yes. That one that is the light and that in him is light and no darkness at all. And he came and he, what Brother Gary had read, that he lights every man that cometh into the world. I believe that world there is the gospel kingdom world, that he lights every man that's going to come into that world. And if you've got light, 
It came from the source, which is Jesus Christ. And he gave you that light. And flies try to get into that from the day one that the Lord Jesus Christ gave you that. He gave you that true light because he is the true light. And flies try to get in that from the very day he gave it to you. And it's our job to keep the flies out of it. And you know what? It's like kind of like Abraham when he was, when the Lord promised him, gave him these, these exceeding great precious promises. And he cut, he said, well, how will I know, Lord, that you're going to give me this land? And the Lord said, he said, you cut up this sacrifice into pieces and you lay it out on this ground. They're out in this desert, in this barren wasteland. There's no proof that that promise is going to be come to pass. And he said, you cut up this sacrifice and you lay these pieces out and you put a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, lay these pieces out so they're not touching each other. And he laid these pieces out and the birds came down and tried to grab those pieces these ravens did. Well, what better thing for a raven to grab a piece of that meat? And that's the way it is. Satan tries to grab those precious promises of God from us. And Abraham's job was he kept those ravens away from those promises. And that's just like Satan. And it's just like those flies. That's like Satan trying to grab those promises that God has given us. And those are exceeding great precious promises that we might be a partaker of his divine nature. They had God himself walking with them and talking with them. The divine one, the divine being of the Godhead, the third person, the father, son, second person. It doesn't really matter. They're all interchangeable, aren't they? They're not going to get jealous one of another because they're all equal. So he's the person of the Godhead. The second person of the Godhead is what we call it. Who put that label on there? The second person. As if they're fighting for, for to be the first, second, third person of the Godhead. But the son person of the Godhead. So they had God himself walking with them. And they received him not. But as many as received him. Because he gave them a birth. That's right. And you're right, Brother Gary. He gave them the birth. And he gave us a birth. Amen. Everyone in this room, he gave us a birth that we could receive him. Yeah. Yeah. And we could have that light, receive that light within us and have that. And we, you understand what I'm saying because you have that light. Yes. And he's the, just the same today. Jesus Christ, the same today. Yeah. Yesterday, today. And I guess today is today. That's, right. That's the only thing I could figure. Yesterday was thousands of years before and eternity before that. And today is today. We can put confidence in him to, for today. That's right. And we need that. That's right. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If we live to see tomorrow, he'll be just the same. And tomorrow will be called today. So we'll have that same confidence. You know, we have that hymn in the, in the book. And I had to pull this, find this while Brother Gary was preaching to us. When Moses and the Israelites from Egypt's land did flee, behind them were proud Pharaoh's hosts, in front of them the sea. God raised the water like a wall and opened up the way. And the God that lived in the olden time is just the same today. Amen. That's the same Jesus back then as it is today. When David and Goliath met the wrong against the right, the giant armed with human strength and David with God's might, God sent a stone by David's sling, the giant loaded lay, and the God that lived in the olden times is just the same today. When Daniel's faith to his God would not bow down to men and by his enemies was hurled into the lion's den. God shut the lion's mouth, we read, and robbed them of their prey. Isn't that a beautiful truth? And the God that lived in the olden times is just the same today. When Pentecost had fully come and fire from heaven did fall, the Savior with the Holy Ghost baptized them one and all. Man. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Woo. Amen. 
Pitchy here, the hallelujahs over that one. Three thousand were converted and were added right away. And the God that lived in the olden times were just the same today. Is just the same today. Man. So then he says, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Yes. Seeing as how Jesus Christ doesn't change. Be not carried about with divers, diverse, different. Everybody's got a doctrine. Like the fly hanging on the microphone. Remember that, brethren. Remember the fly hanging on the microphone. It sounds silly, doesn't it? But that's just about the way it is. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. oh that's such a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Mm -hmm. And Brother Gary talked about that, that the Lord came. He was full of grace and truth. That means you can't get any more in there. If he's full of grace and truth, means you can't fit any more in it. And really, he was full of grace and truth, and, and you can't fit all that in a human body to start with. He was completely just full of grace and truth. And of his fullness have all we received, he said. So of his fullness have all we received. And he's just the same today. So you can't say, well, that's, you know, when people say that, there's them flies in the apothecary again. Well, that was back then. You know, that was back in the old days. That's not, you know, this is different. You know, the Bible is outdated. No, it's not. <laughs> Bible's outdated, you know. I wrote down a couple things here, you know. I, th I thought about Jesus being just the same today. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm regressing here. And you know, Jesus, he, he became, he was the same yesterday. And he humbled himself mm -hmm. and yes. became a man. Yes. This great God, he created everything. This great and powerful God that created everything, and you know, it's still in motion today. And I believe it's probably thousands of years old. <coughs> and I'm not going to argue over time either. That's, yeah. you know, I'm, you, I think you'd have to use the Bible to prove what you believe. And I, I can't really prove it, honestly. I mean, I'm, I'd say it's probably thousands. It doesn't really matter the exact time to me so much, but I'd say probably thousands. But he created everything and he became a man. And you know, that little baby, uh, there was a priest named Simeon and he, he circumcised many babies, Jewish babies. They probably all looked alike. And he circumcised this one baby. He comes in and it was told him by the Lord that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Christ. And this baby comes in, and I don't know, I suppose that baby looked like every baby, but it, he knew that that was the Christ. And he sees this baby, and he says, mine eyes now have seen yes. thy salvation. Yes. Let thy servant depart in peace. Yeah. And it says Jesus Christ the same yesterday. That little baby was still the same Jesus Christ, God, manifest in the flesh. Yeah. This little baby was God manifest in the flesh. And this priest was holding him there and declares that our salvation is in that baby. And he's satisfied. Yeah. Now just let me depart in peace. He's satisfied. That was one of the ways, as I was thinking about this, that he's the same yesterday 
as that little baby. You know, he was a teenage boy, I think about 12. He went back, they went to Jerusalem to pay taxes and, yeah. and he, and he hung out in the, in the synagogue with these lawyers and these uh, professionals, you know, in the, the, in the law. And he went in there and was asking them questions and telling them things they had never heard before. And he never, he wasn't asking them questions because he wanted to learn something. He was asking them questions to teach them. But, you know, he was wise, so he had to do it in a way of asking questions to teach them. And so he was gone. They paid their taxes and took back off, and they was a day's journey before they realized he was, wasn't with them. Mm -hmm. And he, they had to go back and find him. And so they found him teaching these men in the, in the synagogue, synagogue or the temple, one of the two, I can't remember. And so um, finally he, they come back and they find him, and that's what he was doing. Yeah. And he said, wish you not, I must be about my father's business. And so, you know, when he was a teenager, he was just the same. He was the same then too. That that's just remarkable to me. First of all, that he made it through his teenage years without even sinning. That's remarkable to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about your teenage years. Now everybody's going back and thinking, "Wow, I, I don't know about you all, but I am. I am really way before my teenage years. I mean, I'd done shot it way before then. You all probably had to." Way before then, honestly. But he, Jesus Christ, he, he didn't. I wrote down a couple of these here. I don't want to go through that list. <laughs> For it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not, which, not with meats which have not profited them, that have been occupied therein. So these meats, these different doctrines and things, these things are, and the new things that come up, they're not really profitable. They're not. Why do we want that stuff? We've got the best there is already. We've got the best teachings, the best doctrine. We've got the truth. You know, I think people by nature get bored. They do. Well, I know they do. And they want something new and shiny. And we, when we got, already have the best thing there is. He says, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. You know, that's kind of, boy, that's kind of harsh words, isn't it? They have no right to eat. Isn't that something? We don't like to talk to people like that, do we? The Bible talks to people like that. You have no right to eat of that. You're serving the tabernacle. And other, but he's saying that then the, if we don't serve the tabernacle, the law, then we have a right to eat. If we believe in grace, then we have a right to eat of that altar of Jesus Christ, of believing of that in that sacrifice we then we have a right to eat of that altar of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ like Jesus said if, except you eat my body and drink my blood you have no life in you now that's eating of that sacrifice of Christ that altar of grace believing in grace believing in what he has done that finished work complete finished work and he says for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So those bodies of the beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin were burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Mm -hmm. He suffered outside the gate of the city. 
you know, he wasn't he wasn't in the main he wasn't in the clique. He wasn't in the group of the accepted. That's right. He was not. You know, he was a, he was he was the rejected stone by the builders. He was rejected of men. That's right. That's right. God was rejected by men. He still is. That's exactly right, Sister Donna. Still is. And you know, if we accept him as far as grace goes, we'll be rejected too. It's automatic. They got a rubber stamp. Reject. But God's got his rubber stamp too. As they reject you, he will accept you. That's worth it too. That's worth every bit of the suffering, the being rejected like the stone if we're accepted by the Lord. If we're accepted by him, it's worth every bit of that. It reminds me of the blind, I believe it was the blind man. Remember, if any, if any man... Uh, proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ, they would be kicked out of the synagogue. In other words, you're, you're just kicked out of our fellowship if you confess that Christ uh, opened your eyes. If you confess that Jesus opened your eyes from this blindness, then you're going to be rejected from our fellowship. You're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. And he, he, the Pharisees went to the parents and they said, well, he's of age, ask him. You know, they were already scared to be of the, losing this fellowship. And... Um, so they went to him and they said, and he, I love it what he said to them. I don't know if I, I, I can't quote it, but he said, he said, why herein is a marvelous thing. He said, because they were asking him questions. He said, why herein is a marvelous thing. He's opened my eyes and you know, you know not from whence he is. Because they were asking him, whence is this man? Where's he from? Yeah. And he said, why herein is a marvelous thing. Oh, well, it's never been told that anybody opened the eyes of one blind and he opened my eyes and I, it, it was me, all right. I, I was born blind and he opened my eyes and you don't, know, you don't know from whence he is. And they got mad and said, you was altogether born in sin and you teach us? Yeah. Yes, he was teaching you. And yes, he was born blind and he was teaching them because he had an experience they didn't have. Right. He was teaching them. And so they couldn't accept that. And so they kicked him out. They kicked him out of the synagogue. And Jesus went and found him. And when he found him, he had fellowship with Christ. So he was rejected by the men, but he found fellowship. He was accepted by Christ. Jesus knew where he was. He found him and, and had fellowship with him. So we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary. Now, you know what? Jesus took his, his blood into the sanctuary too. Remember when he, was, when he resurrected, Mary Magdalene loved him and she was there at that grave and she wanted to see him and she was crying and she said, she saw someone she thought was the gardener and she said, where have they laid him? If you know, sir, tell me. And she was weeping. And finally, Jesus said, Mary. And that got, she knew right then. Right. That got her attention. That's right. You know the Lord can say one word to you yes. and you know it's his voice. Yes. She was a sheep, wasn't she? She knew her master's voice. She knew just that one word, Mary. And she said, Rabbi, which means Rabbi, master. And he right away had to say, touch me not. I have not yet ascended to my father. He had to stop her. She was about to just grab him and hug him. And I believe Jesus was going to offer that blood. He was going up to heaven to offer that blood. And I think that's what the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest. I believe he was going to offer that blood, to present that blood into the sanctuary, into heaven itself is the sanctuary here. 
at like the high priest did for sin. His body had already been burned without the camp, so to speak. He had already suffered without the gate, right? But now the blood's going to be offered up in the sanctuary. These things are types and shadows of what our Savior did for us. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. <laughs> you know, when they, they broke that law the first time, Moses had, had made these tablets of stone, went up to the mountain, fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and God himself wrote on these tablets. And before he could get down, they broke the law. They had already committed fornication and idolatry and different things. And Moses, as he's coming down, he throws that, those stones down and breaks that law. And they had done that before he even got down. And the second time, they, he gets this law. The Lord tells him, he basically tells him he's going to just destroy that people and he's going to make a people out of Moses, just Moses. And Moses makes intercession, says, no, Lord, you know, what will the Egyptians say? But anyway, so he, he uh, the Lord tells them to put off their ornaments and uh, till he decides what he's going to do. And, but he tells them to take this tabernacle and set it away from the camp and everyone that wants to seek the Lord goes outside of that camp to this tabernacle to seek the Lord mm -hmm. and that's what he's referring to here so this camp this tabernacle is outside mainstream religion and that's what this writer of Hebrews is talking about you know what you believe is outside of mainstream religion you know, it's not, it's not mainstream. You know, they might present it as mainstream. They might present it as the truth. But you know, there's flies in their ointment. And if you, listen real, if you listen real close or if you smell real good or if you smell it, there's flies in their ointment, you know, so to speak. There's flies in it. There's things in it that's not supposed to be in it. But it's not, it's not what, quite what you think sometimes. He says, uh, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. So he's telling them to go away from that camp out to that tabernacle bearing his reproach, bearing that reproach of Christ. Believing, And you know, we have examples of that all through scripture. You go to that 11th chapter of Hebrews. All of those people in that 11th chapter were bearing the reproach of Christ. Even Moses said that he, it was said of Moses that he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. That he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater treasures than the treasures of Egypt. I'm like, wow. That, that kind of let that soak in for a while. He counted the reproach of Christ as a treasure. Um, I was thinking about I was thinking about three young boys that were in the I gotta quit, but I was thinking about three young boys that were taken captive in the Babylonian kingdom by the chat uh, by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. And they, okay, they're in captivity to start with. So this is a, this is a bondage to start with. And, and you know, even in that bondage, they wouldn't bow down to this idolatry. And they don't have any power over in this kingdom because they're in bondage, right? But they said to the king, to the king, and he was the king over like 127 provinces or 120, something like that, over 120 some provinces. They said it to his face. These are three young boys. 
young men, I don't know how old they were, but it doesn't matter how old they were. It doesn't matter if they were old men. They said, we're not careful to answer thee concerning this matter, king. We're not going to bow down to you. Our God is able to deliver us. Whether he will or not, we don't know. But we want you to know we're not bowing down to your idolatrous thing that you made, this 70 foot tall golden image that you made. So just forget it in so many words. Oh, he was furious. It shows. He, he, so he stoked this fire up seven times more than it had ever been stoked up. And in fact, when they opened the door, the men that threw them in there died, I believe, yes. didn't they? Yes. It killed the guys that threw them in there. Right. And they shut the door. And the fire didn't harm those young boys, those young men. Now, I believe that. The fire did not harm them, young men. And Nebuchadnezzar looked into that fire, probably a little, little slit, little peak hole in that, into that furnace, is my guess. That's kind of how they are, I think. And he looked in there, and it probably singed his eyebrows. I don't know if it did or not, but probably singed his eyebrows looking in there. And he looked in there, and he saw a fourth one in there, likened unto the Son of God. Now, how did he know what the Son of God looked like? It was a revelation right there on the spot to what it was. Mm -hmm. There's one in there, like there's a fourth. Didn't we throw three in there? There's a fourth one, like unto the Son of God. And you know that fire did not even, it, they didn't even smell like smoke, their clothes. Now, brethren, I'm sorry, but I, if anybody's ever built fires, and I like to build fires myself, you can ask Vanessa. I like to build fires and I like to watch fires burn and they make fun of me sometimes. I'll sit out there in a chair and watch fire burn. You could pass through that smoke one time, barely pass through it, and you could try to avoid it and think that smoke doesn't even hardly get on you and you go into the house where nobody else has been in it and you smell like smoke. I don't care, care how hard you try. You smell like smoke. The Lord was with those boys and he protected them and they came out of that, that fire not even smelling like smoke. And when they came out, all of, his, all of Nebuchadnezzar's big-willed friends were right there that ran the, helped run the kingdom were right there and they saw that the fire had no power over these boys and who do you think was glorified in that? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. God Almighty got the glory in that. And God wanted all those men to see who was God Almighty in this. Was it that idol? Was it that 90-foot idol, 70-foot idol, however tall it was? It doesn't really matter because it was just a, a foolish thing that he made because he wanted people to bow down to him is really what it amounts to. He was the idol, really, is what it amounts to, Nebuchadnezzar. So God himself and Nebuchadnezzar, he, he got, I don't know how many times God changed the commandments and the decrees of these kings because God showed that he was the one in charge and that he was the one that took Israel into captivity and allowed Babylon to do that, Nebuchadnezzar and these kings to do those things. Another one was Daniel, read about it in the hymn, these men, they didn't like Daniel, and they, they knew Daniel was blameless. Now, the Bible teaches about being blameless, and we think, oh, nobody's blameless. Somebody's, everybody's got something to, you know, everybody's got a fault, everybody's got a sin. But the Bible, when it talks about being blameless, you know, when Daniel, when, when he, 
when he did his job for the king, he was blameless in the way he did his duties. He, you can be blameless in the things you're doing. Now, maybe we're not blameless, but we can be blameless in our duties the way we did. Well, Paul talked about it, that he talked about it when he said that he wanted the, the church to be reconciled to God. Remember when he said that they had the, he had the ministry of reconciliation uh, to witness that God was in Christ, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but reconciling the world unto himself. And then in the next chapter, he said that they approve themselves of the, as the ministers of Christ, that the ministry be not blamed, that they would be blameless. They would, they would, they would uh, approve themselves in all these different situations. And he talked about all those situations, that they would not be found blamed, that the, the church couldn't say, well, I didn't, I wasn't reconciled to Christ because, I mean, after all, Brother Jerry did this, or Brother Jerry did, you know, I couldn't be, you know, the, they could blame, lay the blame on the ministry, in other words. So, in other words, he approved himself to be blameless. So anyway, Daniel was blameless in all he did for the king, Nebuchadnezzar, in that kingdom. And so, the only way they was going to get Daniel, and those men said this, is with his God. That's the only way they could get him is to find blame with him and his God. So they made the king or they tricked the king into make, writing a decree saying that no one could pray except unto the king's God for so many days, knowing that Daniel was going to pray to his God. And Daniel knew this and he knew the decree was signed because he was up in the government as well. And he had his window open every day. They knew where he prayed and when they, he prayed. And Daniel continued to leave his window open. And he continued to pray the same way every day. And boom, they got him. They thought. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They didn't have him, did they? Nope. But they thought they had him. So they threw him in this den of lions. That was the punishment for this. And you know the story. And the, and the king loved Daniel. Yeah. And he was sad and couldn't sleep all night. So in the morning, he says, oh, Daniel, when he goes to the den of lions and, and <laughs> out of that pit, he says, oh, king, live forever or something like that. I forget what it was. And the king had to have been happy. And there's the lions and, they, and there's Daniel. And he must have just been thrilled to death. And Daniel said something about my God whom I served. He knows I'm blameless. I can't, I can't quote it. But he changed the decree of the king. And the king took those men and threw them all in the lion's den. And by now, boy, they were just licking their chops. And they, they, before they hit the ground, those, king, those, those lions ate them. I mean, they got them before they hit the ground. And so the Lord said, reject, right? He rejected those men. The Lord did that, tried to do that to Daniel. He's got the reject stamp too, by the way. He's, he could, you know, he said those men try to get Daniel. So they're done. So God is so good. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same one that was in the beginning yes. as Brother Gary brought out so good this morning. I just, oh, I love that. So uh, let's see, where are we here? So let us go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Let us bear his reproach, brethren. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come by him or by Jesus. Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips. Giving thanks to his name giving thanks to his name. And he calls that the fruit, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. I think that's to fellowship, but to do good and to fellowship, forget not. 
for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. You know, you know, uh, fellowship is a sacrifice, and with such sacrifices as fellowship, God is well pleased. You know, you come here today, and that's a pleasing sacrifice to God to fellowship. It is, and, and sometimes we don't feel like. You know, we, sometimes we, we feel like, well, that's hardly a sacrifice. We get a blessing out of it, and that's true. We get a blessing out of it, yet with that, God's well pleased. Mm -hmm. So he blesses us coming and going, doesn't he? Yeah. It's, isn't it amazing how good the Lord is to us? Amen. All the time. All the time. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. God bless you all.